Good morning. Today, I get to introduce to you Sally Clarkson, in case you don't know her. If you're not a homeschooling mom, maybe you haven't followed her for years and years like some of my friends have. She is the author of over 40 books. There's a legacy right there for you, Sally, don't you think? I think so. <laughs> yes, I think so, too. I hope so. I hope it matters. Yes. Uh, pardon me? I said, I hope it matters. Oh, it does matter. I'm sure it does. And we're going to be talking about your latest one today, just in time for the Christmas rush. And it is a beautiful book. And we're going to be talking a lot about it. First of all, though, um, please tell us a little bit about your family and how you got to live part time in Oxford, England. Well, <clears throat> I, uh, I have four uh, grown children, four adult children, and three of the four of them live in uh, the UK, in wow. um, Oxford and London. And all four of my grandkids live there. Wow. And um, I, uh, a few years ago, I, I'm an author of books. I travel, I speak, I do podcasts. I have lots of fun in ministry. And a few years ago, my daughter called me and she said, Mom, she was living in Oxford. And she said, I got a full scholarship for my master's of theology here in Oxford, but I can't do it unless you can come take care of uh, my baby who is about to be born. Oh. Uh, two hours a week. Was so, it her first? Was it her first baby? It was her first one. Oh yeah. yeah. She got married and then she got pregnant and um, all the while <laughs> while she was in school there. And um, so I said, well, uh, my husband said, I'll see if we can find a reasonable flat hmm. and um, send you over because you need a sabbatical anyway. Oh. And he back and forth part of the time. And I had two other children who were getting their PhDs in the UK at that time. Wow. <laughs> So uh, I uh, went over, and um, that was the beginning of a, about a, almost five years in Oxford. Wow. And uh, eventually I worked in two different places for two different churches. And um, one was just with a whole bunch of women during COVID. Yeah. And then the other one <clears throat> was uh, mentoring PhD st graduate students in Oxford. Wow, what an, uh, an opportunity that would not have happened if your kids hadn't gone abroad. No, but in order for me to stay there, I had to have, a, <clears throat> so I had to have a job. So I oh. had a degree in the States and then I had my, um, wow. I had a job visa in the UK and the Lord miraculously provided it. I was there for a little bit over four years, between four and five years. So and, you couldn't, you couldn't just stay there just to take care of your grandchildren. The, the government wouldn't let you, you have to have a job. Yeah. Well, um, you can, you can be a tourist for up to six <clears throat> months <clears throat> on the average. And um, so eventually I was able to get visas and be able to stay there the whole time. Wow. What a unique opportunity. Did you ever think 40 years ago that that would happen? <laughs> well, that's part of why I wrote this book, Well Lived, because um, I thought, I, as I look back on my life, there have been so many twists and turns and opportunities and adventures. And I thought, I want women to know that they can, women, men, whoever, uh, that there are many adventuresome doors that the Lord mm. opens if we're willing to walk through it. Mm. No, I couldn't have imagined, but I did spend a, a number of years in Europe before that. So there was a little bit of an imagination. <laughs> mm. Mm. I love that. If willing to walk through it, I would say a lot of people listening today say, Hey, I would jump on that, but you just never know. And it depends on where you are in your, well, in your professional journey, as well as in your parenting journey. All those things came together uh, well for you. I want to back up a little bit. My listeners love backstories. So um, how did you first become passionate about helping moms become better moms? <clears throat> uh, well, actually, I, I it didn't start with that. I, I was a single missionary working in Eastern Europe uh, hmm. for a student organization. And I worked and traveled in the com and when it was a communist, mm -hmm. uh, very, very old. <laughs> and um, I lived in Vienna for a while, but then I worked in Romania, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Hungary, and Poland, hmm. and then eventually moved in for, to Poland for several years, and um, I fell in love with discipleship. I, uh, When I became a Christian, though I had been in church many years, I, um, I really thought if a Christian knew the God who put the stars into place, they should be different. Somehow they should love better, they should... Uh, be more interesting, they should be more adventurous and whatever, you know, that their lives would be fuller of the beauty of God. And so when someone um, knocked on my 10th floor dorm room and shared Christ with me, it was life changing for me. And so I fell in love with mentoring and discipleship. Okay, and so when you heard this person, so you weren't a believer then? 
you know, I didn't understand. I, and, I when, and when, and when, and was that, and obviously that was before you became a missionary. Oh, yes. And so where were you living when you got a knock on the door? I was in the, uh, living in Texas, completing my degree at Texas Tech University. Okay. And so someone just knocked on your door random, well, random, nothing's random with God. And you had already been asking these questions about God or no? Oh, yeah. I had, I had been uh, <clears throat> said, if there's a God in the universe, will you send someone to explain yourself to me? Wow. And, That's um, a great prayer. Uh, I know. <laughs> you know. I didn't tell anyone. And um, this sweet woman came to my door, knocked on the door and said, can I do a religious survey with you? And I said, well, of course. I thought, I'm kind of interested in that right now. <laughs> hmm. And then um, she shared uh, how I could know the love of God. Hmm. And that was the transforming um, notion for me to think that he knew me and he still loved me mm -hmm. and that, uh, that he created me for a purpose. So those two things really uh, caught hold in my life and caught my imagination. Then I went on staff with the organization two years in the United States and then many years overseas <clears throat> uh, working in all these different countries. Came home, got married and um, really- how old, how old were you when you got married? I was almost 30. See, I was 35 and I was a missionary with Wycliffe. It sounds like you were with Crew, oh, really? Crusade. Yeah. And so um, when I, I was, um, I had never changed a diaper in my life. I had never thought I would be a mother. I never thought about it. And when I was holding my first child in my hands, I thought, oh my goodness, this, this is a human being whose life is going to have eternal consequences. And it, it just dawned on me that God had entrusted to me and to my husband, the discipleship, the mentoring, um, the the shaping of a human being whose soul would, you know, have eternal consequences. So um, I felt like he whispered to me then, I mean, I look back on this and I wrote it in my journal, but how are you going to so love this child that they will love me as an adult, that they will mm -hmm. love me when they're a teenager? How are you wow. going to so imprint the, the heart and mind and soul of this child with truth and virtue that they will have direction to walk in in their lives as they grow older. And so it was a aha moment for me. And I thought everything I've ever taught about mentoring and discipling, I loved the stories of Christ. I loved that he changed the world by real relationships with real people. And so uh, that just transferred to my understanding of what it meant to be um, a mother, to, to be able to mentor my children for him. Um, somebody who might be listening might have also prayed that they could imprint on their baby and then child and then teenager's life and young adult. We never stop being parents. Right. The love of Christ and how to model a discipled life, and yet their child is not walking with the Lord. What would you say to them to encourage them? I would say keep praying, keep loving. Um, I think that Jesus understood this and um, he understood our anguish that w w we would have as he has anguish with people who turn away from him. And um, that's why he told the story of the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. because I believe that um, Jesus <clears throat> is pictured as the father who daily was hoping, praying that his son would return and mm -hmm. embraced him. And I think that um, oftentimes I, I really love women. I think they're <laughs> amazing civilizers and, and so on. And I, <laughs> I know many stories of women um, who have prayed and prayed and prayed and watched their children turn around, uh, begin to make decisions. I think that many of us didn't realize what a chaotic world it was that we were sending our children into. Yes. Um, and, and so I do think that God cares deeply for these parents who have this anguish mm. and he also wanted to say that, you know, he would, as a shepherd, go after the, the lost sheep, mm -hmm. leave the 99 to go after the lost one. And he gave the prodigal son parable because I think he wanted us to understand that he knew that that would be a part of what was happening. That's what happened to Adam and Eve for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That happened to my mother. My oldest brother was a prodigal for many years, and uh, she would pray with her girlfriends at the dinner table, and I would sort of, you know quietly go through the kitchen because here she was here was mom crying again because he's nine years older <laughs> and then god turned him around at 27 and then he was a wickliffe missionary for 32 years so uh, oh. it's a beautiful redemption story 
And I tell it often because, and Hyatt will tell you, you still call me the black sheep. I go, well, you were, and you broke mom's heart for many years. Mm -hmm. And yet God uh, redeemed you. And it has nothing to do with you, Hyatt, even though you're famous now, at least in our circles. <laughs> and um, it's it's always about God. And uh, he celebrates his second birthday with Christ just as much as his first. So mm -hmm. I think that's encouraging. And we need to keep saying it because some of these mothers hearts have been broken for many years. Oh, yeah, I think so. I just was reading a story about Monica and Augustine. And she <clears> for him, I think, for 18 years. Mm -hmm. And for her husband for over 20. Wow. And both of them became thoroughly committed to the Lord. And uh, I think that, you know, that for for us to go astray is, is a common theme throughout all of the Bible. Yes, that's so true. And yet he keeps calling us back. Um, and it does matter that we are faithful. It does matter so much to the heart of God that you seek to be faithful. And sometimes when I'm trying to encourage someone that I know and love to remain faithful, she feels like giving up. Of course. So it's hard for me to, well, it's hard for me to not sound like just Christianese where you just need to trust God, but she does just need to trust God. But to yes. say, to come alongside in an empathetic way, but yet still encourage her to, to cling to him. And I think it's those cups of tea and little notes and flowers and I love you. I'm so thankful you're my friend that also help a little bit. <laughs> oh, I totally agree. Yeah, we don't always have to be preaching. It's how we come alongside. Mm -hmm. um, so I was going to ask you, was there a particular moment when you knew you were to mentor moms? But I think you shared it when you were holding your firstborn. Mm -hmm. um, what has been the biggest surprise along the way? as far as discipling women? You know, I, I, I've been in, I've been at this for so long, <laughs> um, 50 years now, um, that I don't know if there were, I guess the surprise was that God would use me. Uh. You know, sometimes I look back and I think that um, probably he asked 50 other women to do some of the things I've done. And he said, well, She's not that skillful, but she has a good heart. So we'll use her anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even have a good heart sometimes, but it's in spite of us, right, Sally? Yeah, I mean, I, I just, that's why I wrote this book about legacy. I thought, I am so blessed. I got to live a legacy and God mm -hmm. is, he uses broken and normal people. And mm -hmm. I wanted to encourage women to be bold about um, stepping out in faith and right where they are, the story that they have is the exact story that, God wants to use in their lives to to reach their neighbors or children or workers or you know whatever it, it's a, it's something unique to each person. Mm. Yeah, they don't have to be famous and they don't have to have a big conversion story. They just have to be talking about how God is working with them right now. Right, exactly. Um I was when I got your book in the mail, it's so beautiful and I thought, wow, this is this could be a beautiful coffee table book. You know, we talk about coffee table books because of the beauty the photographs, and the inspiration. Uh, I think you wrote it to help women live fully right now. Mm -hmm. uh, is that your passion behind it? Oh, yeah. I um, Well, for one thing, it was really fun. And, and this is what sometimes people can't get through podcasts, but there are hundreds of beautiful pictures from Oxford. <laughs> I know. Uh, a crew came and, and followed me to all my favorite places. A crew of three women from the States you know, and um, set these pictures up. So that was fun. But um, I, I just want, I think that women are quite discouraged in this mm. day and time, and they feel a lack of direction. There's so many opinions, and yes, I, I feel like uh, I wanted to write a book that would give grace and inspiration and uh, beauty and, and call women to their best selves. Women, as I said a minute ago, I love women. They have capacity. They More than they know, I have mm -hmm. more capacity than I thought I did. I didn't know I would ever be an author of this many books or get to do podcasts or get to do what I've done, been able to do. I've, I've been able to do a lot. Um, and so women have more capacity than they think. And they also have agency, which is <laughs> um, they have the ability to decide how to steward their story in such mm -hmm. a way that they can bring the most light to their world. To what do you mean? What world. do you mean they have the ability to decide? That's what agency is. Agency mm -hmm. means I have the ability to make a decision, uh, to start a group, to take cookies to my next door neighbor, to 
uh, get a little bit more education or to go to a, a conference. I I am the one ruling. I, I talk about being a queen at the beginning of the book in the sense of a queen has a domain over which she rules and brings order and beauty and goodness there. And we have the ability to look at the story that we've been given. It's the right story, wherever we are, and say, what have I learned? How can I live in such a way that, you know, I can um, spread light to the place where I actually am at this moment? I have mm. the ability to make that decision. Mm. And um, we aren't stuck. We can always make some kind of a decision to move in the direction of um, the goodness, the beauty, the love, the power of Christ. Uh, when he in, lives in our imagination. <clears throat> of all the legacy taglines, well, I haven't really been clear on the name of your book. It's called Well Lived, Shaping a Legacy of Gratitude and Grace. I'm so glad you found my podcast since it's about legacy. Mm -hmm. But of all the legacy taglines, you chose a legacy of gratitude and grace. Why those two legacies in particular to help us love well? Well, I think that uh, for a while I... <clears throat> When I was younger, as a believer, I was immature, and I would I would fight with the Lord. You know, is, are you sure you're making the right decisions for me, or why did this yes. happen? <laughs> um, you know, what's going on here? And then I would I began to realize that yes, God was challenging me and sharpening me and stretching me and building my spiritual muscle, but actually by following Him through all of those seasons, I began to see that He was taking away from my life the things that I had depended on that weren't going to satisfy me anyway. Mm -hmm. And he was leading me in a direction of deep joy and satisfaction and understanding grace more fully. And so I think that when we come to the point of saying, God, I know that you're good <clears throat> and I am going to thank you for what you are doing in my life, for who you are, that even when I can't see you, you are there. And so I kind of planted a flag and said, the rest of my life, I will believe that God is good, and I will be thankful for what he has given to me. And so before I get out of bed every morning, just a little thing, mm -hmm. but I try to bring to mind four things that I'm thankful for. Maybe they will be new things. Maybe they will be people. Maybe they will just be a circumstance. But I try to start the habit of being thankful before I get out of bed in the morning. Mm. Great. Before getting out of bed. That's even before coffee, though I am thankful for coffee. I am very thankful for coffee. And oh, I know. And tea. Um, I'm how, a caffeine person. <laughs> how do you define a life well lived? And can it be defined differently for different people? Oh, yeah. I, I think it's generally, uh, it, it's the same. I mean, by that, um, it's taking the stuff of your life and determining to put it into God's hands and say, I am your girl. I am here to serve you, to worship you. And I, I want to know what you would, um, I've often said, I think, um, Lord, what would your Holy Spirit dream through me? Hmm. And um, I take a time once a year to write <clears throat> down ideas and thoughts and how he might be uh, working in my life to, to give me something that I can do or um, something I can write or whatever. Hmm. Um, and so um, I'm sorry, I got a little bit distracted because I'm looking at my dog out the door. <laughs> All right. Uh, she's distracting me. So what was the what was the ultimate question again? Well, the ultimate question you answered, putting your um, life in God's hands and say on a regular basis that I'm yours, what would the Holy Spirit dream through me? I just heard a woman's testimony over the weekend who's, who was struggling with you know, feeling stuck. And she, I guess, newly recognized that scripture. I, I think it's in Philippians where... Paul says that we have the power of the resurrection. And she goes, oh, Lord, give me your power. And then she went <laughs> on to tell us this super wonderful story. Yet other things are still challenging in her life. So I told oh, her, even yeah. though she's 10 or 15 years younger than I, I'm 72. And she's probably, you know, 60 or 59 or something. I don't know. She's darling. And uh, and I told her, I said, you know what, Melanie, because of your story this morning, I prayed that the next 20 years will be filled with God's power, like yeah. the best years of my life instead of, yeah, I, think I'm winding, I think I'm winding down. This is how I've been thinking, you know, is there so much gas in the tank? Well, maybe I'll be slower at it and more gray hair. But the point is, is that we have the power of God's resurrection in our lives. And we forget, we forget to take, uh, take advantage of that. 
Well, I think so. And I think too, you have to take the good with the bad. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I was thinking about marriage or children or whatever. Um, the, the reason that I stay faithful in marriage and that I um, love my husband and try to be patient with him is because God asked me to. Yeah, I not do because it. he deserves it. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I think I think that sometimes when you just do the right thing, <laughs> you realize how much of a blessing it was to you. Yeah. Um, you know, when my kids would uh, maybe <laughs> drive me a little bit nuts, mm -hmm. uh, and then I would think, um, you know, Jesus said, "I am gentle and meek. Learn from me." And I would think, okay, what would the gentle thing be to do? And it would mm -hmm. be to understand them, to know, you know, to to say kind words. And then I would watch them respond with their whole heart. Uh, so I think I learned over years that um, even sometimes when I think things are difficult, they are the very place where God is teaching me and where God will use me. Yes. And also it makes me more empathetic and compassionate for someone oh, who's struggling. So much. Yeah. So much if so. If you haven't failed, you can't have compassion. And <laughs> God allows us to fail. <laughs> God allows us to fail. And I don't like it, but I'm also so grateful, at, right. at least on the tail end of it. How does one know that they are thriving or simply surviving life? I think by faith, um, you know, because I I wish I had known when I became a, a believer many years ago that what it meant to live in a fallen world. Mm -hmm. I wish I had known that it would be so chaotic. I wish I had known that people who called themselves Christians would disappoint me or hurt me. Mm -hmm. I wish I had known about <clears throat> illness and difficulty, that that was a part of what it meant to be in a broken world. Mm -hmm. Because uh, <clears throat> then I could have handled some of the difficulties more. Um, but I feel like you and I are, I'm a uh, year younger than you. Yep. I like and we have probably lived through many seasons so that we can be a comfort Right. To other women who are going through things that maybe were a struggle for us. Mm -hmm. And I think that when someone feels stuck, sometimes they need to say, okay, what is in my life right now? A place, a person, a thing where while I'm waiting for my circumstances to change, I might be able to be a blessing, a gift, a friend. And um, I think that oftentimes our lives don't turn out like we thought they would. But what I've seen is if I wait long enough, <clears throat> it does seem that God brings meaning to that difficult, stuck time. Mm -hmm. And either I learn an attitude that I needed to change, or I become wiser, like you said, more able to give context to people and love them. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of the Christian life is learning to be patient. I tell you, I studied patience one time in scripture and I decided I never should never have. do that again. <laughs> yeah. Haven't you been warned? It's not the best thing to say. Yeah. Study. Yeah. I was too naive then. <laughs> yeah. A lot of patience in this life. I think that's what faith is. I well, we, faith is the application when you need to have patience. <laughs> yes. Faith is the application and it's waiting. I wrote an article once called living in the land of the unseen. We do not. I've had to ask God by faith or actually thank him by faith. Mm -hmm. That he is doing a work that I do not see because by faith, mm -hmm. uh, that that's you know that's what Christianity is. Well, you know, if, if we knew everything, we wouldn't have yeah. to have it. It's the assurance of things hoped for, right? The conviction of things not seen. And um, no, I so agree. But I think that it's so important to get that rhythm of obedience. Mm. It's it's uh, it's it's something that changes your life. What do you mean by that? Well, I think that. Uh, we're, we live a little bit in a context in Christianity in America where we say, if I prayed something in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the blood he shed on the cross, then God is obligated to do my will. Right. We, we kind of tell God what his will is for yes. us. Yes. And what I see is that God uh, oftentimes has works for me to do or people for me to minister to or things he wants me to grow in that maybe I didn't understand at the time, but when I learned to say, he says, if you love me, obey me. Mm. And I would say, you know, God, I do love you. And so I'm going to do what is right in this situation. What I believe is, is wisdom from scripture, because I do love you and I'm going to obey you. And then when we do what might have seemed hard or might have seemed to cost us too much, um, I've always seen in my life as I look back that the hand of God was working in a way that would cause me to flourish in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, because we're such a, <clears throat> a quick generation, we want 
we want immediate growth. We want immediate answers. And I used to claim that Psalm, the verse in Psalms, you know, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you. It became the desires of your heart <clears throat> and it became very transactional. Right. And I thought, wait, wait, he wants me to be happy. Therefore, he's going to answer this prayer rather than being more mature and saying, but God, you know all things. And I certainly don't. Right. And also, I, I think that God has a, a, you know, it's kind of like a toddler wanting the bag of potato chips. Yes. Um, and the mother has much more aspirations. You know, you might become a professor who would teach the world about truth someday. No, I want the potato chips. You know? <laughs> yeah. Or, uh, you know, maybe you're going to be a, a person, whatever. Um, God, God is not threatened by our tantrums, but he is always willing to stretch us and to make us more holy like Christ. Hmm. Can you share a time in your life where you knew you needed to make a change or two to thrive and not just survive? And how did you make that change? Yeah, I um, I think that way back when I was first a missionary in Eastern Europe, I've never been to a communist country. I didn't know it would be so hard. I didn't know the people really would put our, my the girls we were working with in prison, and they did. Um, and I thought, you know, I, and this is what I think with most women, they're, they're being taxed on a regular basis, day by day by day. Um, they're giving of themselves and they're emptying themselves. And I realized that if I didn't refuel, there was not going to be anything for anyone to be able to draw from me. And so I talk about a little bit in the book, you talk, you probably read the chapter about delight, mm -hmm. but I think that I put, I began to think I need to put rhythms in my life daily, weekly that will restore my soul, mm -hmm. that will that will remind me that beauty matters. And so <laughs> people make fun of me for drinking so much tea. But I do have a ritual in the mornings. I get up, I light a candle, I put music on, and I drink my wonderful hot cup of tea and open my heart to the word and to the Lord. Um, I have a, a time every Saturday, I'm either with a friend or one of my children going out to a fun place for breakfast where uh, we just are friends, and then we go on a long walk afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I put uh, hot baths into my life. I eat a piece of dark chocolate uh, caramel every night <clears throat> after I have dinner before I go to bed because it's delightful to me. <laughs> um, anyway, you know, whatever it is, I have a whole list of resources that can fill me up. Friends that when I'm with them, they call me to my best self and I'll call mm. them regularly. I have appointments with them wherever they live in the United States, in the world. Um, because I know that spending time with my sweet, wonderful, loving friends is going to help me to refuel. Mm. Yeah, that's the true. I think that's that. I think that's godly self-care. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people are either for self-care over an abundance to where it becomes an idol or anti self care because it has the word self in it. But right. God loves us so much and He delights in us and He's given us proclivities and propensities and things that things that delight me do not necessarily delight you, but it doesn't matter. He just mm -hmm. wants us to say, Hey, this is a gift from me. Enjoy it and stop being such a cur curmudgeon. Um, we all have trials <clears throat> of one kind or another. From your experience, can you share what has helped you in trials to live graciously? and at rest in spite of the challenges? I think just experience. It's been, uh, you know, I don't fight against things as much as I used to. Mm. I used to think, you know, shake my fist at heaven and say, why? And now I think that doesn't do me any good, um, honestly. <laughs> um, the more I have learned to say, God has been good to me. I have grown. I have learned. I'm here for his purposes. Um, I, I think just not... I think that, uh, again, I hate to use this toddler example, but um, toddlers are more prone to crying all the time mm -hmm. when something doesn't go their way. And I learned that, uh, it, I don't know, God is my companion for many years now. And I learned that he is gracious. And I learned that um, I believe he is here. I see him in evidence every day. I'm a, I'm a real walker. That's another way I regroup. Uh, I walk several miles a day. And um, I just open my eyes and say, God, show me your fingerprints. Mm -hmm. And so I spend more time really in communion with God in a very gentle way. It's nothing, I'm not talking about some kind of supernatural event that I have. No, I just love him. And um, the more I love him, the more I've trusted him and just let, okay, do whatever you want to. Mm -hmm. uh, I need you to work. Uh, I still pray for things I want. 
and God still answers me. But um, in general, I've learned not to fight against it so much. It costs a lot to to fight against the will of God. Yeah, it's kind of a waste of time, but we don't figure that out till we're a little bit older. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what has helped you grow in your love for God through the years of knowing him? I would probably say uh, being in the will, be, being in the word. Um, the more I, I ponder the the parables and the way that Jesus held a you know prostitute's face in his hands and loved her and accepted her, and I thought, and that's how he loves and accepts me. And then when I would uh, I was pondering the Last Supper and uh, I saw, my goodness, he washed a hundred and twenty dirty men toes, and I thought, and and um, I have the opportunity to wash all of these sweet little toes in my family. And um, that he would cook for them. He made, you know, fried fish on the beach. And so really a lot of the stories um, touched me. But the thing that changed my life the most when I became a believer, which has never changed, is that I grew up uh, feeling like I was never going to be acceptable, that I was mm -hmm. never going to do enough to be good or to be pleasing. And when I understood how much God loved me, that his love never changes, that nothing could separate me from his love. Um, that gave me kind of an overall life purpose, which I try to do today. When I see someone, is there a way that I can leave an imprint of God's love in their lives? And so as I was going through Oxford, I would you know, say to my barista, you make me so happy every day. Mm -hmm. You are the happiest person in my life when it comes to eight o'clock in the morning. And Or you know, I would see a, a, the next door neighbor who never talked to me, and I would say, that is the cutest dog I've ever seen. Does the dog have a backstory? And then we would become friends. And so I have made up little games about how I can extend love to people and then invite them in my home. Dinners and food and coffee and tea and chocolate always opens the hearts of people that I'm trying to get to know. Amen. I, I've been speaking on that for years and <laughs> it's nice to have someone else on my team. There you go. Doing it in different States and countries. Mm -hmm. Um, well, this probably your, you just answered this question. How are you able to share God's gospel grace with people who can't be bothered or who don't seem to need him or even acknowledge that he exists? Is it with the, yeah, cho I, the chocolate and the invitation? Yeah, I really do. I, I had um, people from many countries in my life in Oxford, and I always noticed that when I taught a Bible study in a more formal place, um, People was kind of deer in the headlights, you know, they, they just were very quiet because it was an international group of people. But then when I would invite them over, I'd say, let's have a potluck. And I would always let them bring something. And sure. we would have these big feasts and I would light candles and put on the music and we would stuff into my tiny little dining room. But um, I found that their hearts opened, they giggled, they laughed, they stayed longer, they told stories. And I think that sometimes... Uh, we feel like we're supposed to say some verse or some doctrinal yeah. piece to everybody every time. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes what I needed more was just unconditional love. And what the women oftentimes eventually opened up to was just a place to belong, a people who loved them um, and, and celebrating life together. And eventually it would open up the door to me as an introvert to share more deeply about the love of God. So true. Um, you talk about having an outlook on life that makes all the difference. What do you mean by that? And do we just muster it up or how, how do we go about changing our outlook? I think that when you read scripture, I keep saying this, but um, I really realize that God loved us so much that he came and he gave and he served and he lived a human life. And, um, and so I, I, uh, I was in actually in Eastern Europe at one point, and I was in a very difficult time in my life. And um, I had just been meeting with a bunch of different people in different countries, and every one of them was heartbroken and sad and had terrible lives. Oh, and I was going through a difficult time too. And I saw this <clears throat> little child, uh, and it was in a park, and they were they lifted up their hands. They were trying to catch the blossoms of a spring tree that was snowing down all these little blossoms. And it was as though the Lord said to me that. When I say I want you to be like a little child, I want you to look at the beauty. I want you to choose to cultivate joy, to, to whatever you water is going to grow. And I want you to, to make a, a commitment. What 
do you want to be the rest of your life? And I, I um, started a blog called I Take Joy. I thought I'm going to take joy if it kills me. <laughs> but uh, I studied joy. I saw it as a fruit of the spirit. I saw it as a part of the heart of God that he wants us to celebrate with him. And so it changed my life because I not every moment all the time, but I practiced it. I wrote about it. I studied it. I memorized verses about it. And my soul and my heart and my mind became changed by the, the theological concept that was truly God enacting his joy in and through my life. So repeat that line. You you made a commitment. What kind of woman I want to be? Is that what you said? Yeah. I mean, I, I look back on different times in my life when I would plant a flag and I would say from this moment forth, I'm not going to um, to doubt God. I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to tell him my feelings, but it's ridiculous to go back and forth and back and forth in, in my believing yeah. or doubting. And uh, that's what I did about this whole commitment to the rest of my life. I thought, I am going to take joy if it kills me. <laughs> so basically, writing about joy, cultivating joy, whatever you water does grow. And um, my my choices to believe, to practice joy, to love people have shaped the actions of my whole life. Hmm. Um, what's the difference between what you just said and those who don't believe in God as a personal savior, but talk about manifesting where they say, I today am going to do my yoga and then I'm going to do, I'm just going to be joyful. What's the difference between what you just said and someone who just decides? Well, I think that um, Christian means Christ in one. And in the same way, uh, Christ comes into our lives. The Holy Spirit is a companion. The Holy Spirit gives us wisdom, speaks to us, gives us mm -hmm. life, uh, provides us the strength that we need to have. Um, I think that manifesting uh, positive attributes, which are wise, also helps people. I think anything you do that's in a biblical wisdom sort of way is oftentimes going to have their results, uh, some results, but there is a limitation to what we can do by just gutting it out. It doesn't really manifest a change in our lives, inside of our hearts, inside of our minds. And um, that's what I knew pretty <clears throat> distinctly once I asked Christ into my life, once I said, my life is yours. I could just feel the sense of I have destiny now. I have companionship. I have unshakable wisdom. Mm -hmm. And um, have I doubted? Oh, of course I have. I'm a human being. But I think that um, that my commitments carried me through the times of difficulty. Mm -hmm. That's so good. So I'm writing it down. My commitments carried me through the times of difficulty. Mm -hmm. It's so true. But you don't know it until you <laughs> until you experience I, it. I feel like that's why you and I write, speak. We want other people to know that they are not alone, that their right. lives matter, that they are seen. Uh, what legacy do you want to make sure you pass along to those who know and love you? Um, I think the main thing I want my people to know is that they are deeply, deeply loved and seen by God. Um, love was what transformed my life. And I think we, I think love is the oxygen that we long for in order to stay alive spiritually and emotionally. And so I want to, um, you know, I try to be cognizant of sending people notes, bringing them a gift, um, making meals, um, affirming their value to <clears throat> me, because I think that the whole essence of the heart of God is that says in scripture, God is love. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to try to manifest that. I, you have that word in my mind now. <laughs> I'm going to try to exemplify that um, in, in small ways and big ways. I, mm -hmm. I, I have this little grandchild, and when she was two, I started making her cups of tea. I got her a little rattan chair at a secondhand store, and she had her own chair, and she had her own little cup. And I said, from this moment on, we're going to be friends and share cups of tea together. So every morning she would come into my room, say, wake up, Queenie. They call me Queenie. That's in the book, too. Um, <laughs> Queenie, wake up. It's our time. Time to be friends. And um, so it's it's exhibiting love in a practical way. Mm. I just uh, interviewed Kathy Lip, and she said, food, when we give food to someone, it helps them feel seen. 
And I really <laughs> think that you and I agree with that, even if it's a, a bit of chocolate or a cup of uh, apple juice that our kids think is tea or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how God, God speaks to us. Queenie, Sue, wake up. I want to spend this time with you. But I, I don't think he just means waking up from sleep, but waking up from our doldrums or mm -hmm. our, our pity parties, you know. Uh, he goes, just get out of that. You don't need to be in a pity party because I am here and I love you and I see you. It's kind of what he said to Job. He didn't answer his question, but he did. He did say, you know, I am the God. But I think that the God was the designer of food and yeah. of color and of beauty and dimension. And he in intended that we use it for his glory and celebrate the fun that he has provided for us. Mm. I love this. Um You've answered the last question, which is how does your life embody the welcoming heart of God with your little granddaughter, but also with the world through your, through your many books. What's your favorite part about this book? Uh, I, I have, have to say that the pictures, <laughs> uh, I mean, I love the stories too. Obviously yeah. stories and scripture are very <clears throat> important to me. I just love that. It's a holistic book that, um, that there are many beautiful quotes, that there are many beautiful pictures and that there are many, hopefully, beautiful admonitions and stories. Yeah. Oh, it's I can so much fun to do an adult, um, you know how they say these children's picture books? Yeah. I call this my adult picture book. Oh, I love it. <laughs> uh, and let me tell you, this is um, a great time for you to buy one of these books for yourself, I'm telling my audience, as well as one for someone who really needs to, um, what is the word, feel the lavish love of God through beauty the photos, the stories, and the inspiration to cling tighter to God, and just to enjoy what God has given us. Um, I re read recently in John Mark Comer's book about practicing the way that we just feel embraced by God every day because he's there wanting to embrace us, mm -hmm. and we won't uh, wake up and have our cup of tea with him in a rattan chair. Yeah, Sally, <laughs> this has been delightful. Thank you so much for your time. And I hope everyone goes out. Tell us the name of the book again and where people can find you. It's called Well Lived. Um, what is the next word? Living. Oh, I've got the book right here. <laughs> shaping a Legacy of Gratitude. Shaping. We, we uh, worked on that verb for a long time. Shaping, nurturing, building. Anyway, Shaping a Legacy of Gratitude and Grace, Reflections from Oxford. Yeah, so beautiful. Thank you. And people can find you at sallyclarkson.com. Is that correct? Sallyclarkson.com and at Home with Sally is my podcast. Home with Sally. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. you so much. This is great.